Hey guys, Nathan here, Absurd Being, um, into Kierkegaard number 15, but who's counting? Let's have a look at the diagram. Uh, so you can see we're in the bottom right hand corner here. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the leap and decision uh, and also resolution. And uh, and the next video will we'll finish up this little part of the diagram by looking at temporality and the moment. Uh, but today, let's have a look at the first part of the video, which is going to be the leap. All right, so the leap is basically any transition which doesn't happen through cumulative, gradual change. So it's Kierkegaard calls this, this type of cumulative, gradual progression quantitative. The idea being that you can... Um, kind of step by step progress from say A to B. The leap on the, the leap um, is rather a qualitative and sudden transition. So there's nothing you can do from A, um, nothing you can do gradually to kind of get yourself to B. It's it's a it's a um, a change. A transition which which happens immediately, instantaneously. There's no there's there's, there's no gradual progression. Um, so that's what the leap is. And I think if we if I give you some examples, it will it will make the idea a bit clearer. Um, one place where the leap happens or the leap is required is between the time when. Well, is, is during the transition from no self to self. If you remember way back in the, the early videos, we talked about how Kierkegaard thinks um, self comes about through that, that synthesis. And, um, and he says that at that time, spirit posits itself by apprehending possibility and then rising up again, grasping finitude um, and becoming concrete becoming a self and that transition from no self to self requires a leap there's nothing um, <clears throat> you can do as as a non-self to gradually get closer to selfhood and then finally attain it there's no um, there's no bridge you can build between separating not the the, the um, no self and selfhood. <clears throat> Another place where where we can see this is in becoming. Um, where becoming, remember, was the movement from possibility to actuality. Also, actually, it was is the same as non-being to being. Um, <clears throat> but there's nothing you can do from possibility to get you to actuality. That, that that leap or the, that transition requires the leap. It requires, um, you know, if, if you're in the realm of, say, possibility, uh, no matter how much possibility you accrue, it's never going to turn into actuality. You're going to need something special, some kind of... Um, a more radical transformation has to happen here. And that's what the leap does for Kierkegaard. It, it, it gets you from possibility to actuality um, in a way that you kind of don't go through the, the intermediate um, phases or the, you, don't, you don't cross over, uh, you don't cross through the, the intermediate space between the two. Um, so that's, those are a couple of examples. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, and that, that, that's actually quite good, I think. I, I quite like this idea that there is something um, more radical here happening when, when you go from, say, possibility to actuality. You can't just get there with more possibility. Um, I think that that's, there, there is an insight there. But as with 
as always with Kierkegaard, there's a, there's a religious connection, and that comes in, in this form, uh, where he says accidental historical truths are never sufficient to get us to eternal truths of reason. Um, that the transition from the former to the latter requires a leap. And this is going to be um, where, where he will invoke faith. And my quote here, the leap cannot be taught or imparted directly exactly because it is an act of isolation that precisely regarding what cannot be thought leaves it to the individual whether he will decide to accept it in faith and on the strength of the absurd. So again, there's that, that same idea that you can't go from accidental, historical, objective truths to eternal truths. You can't get from, from the one to the other. Eternal, yeah, eternal truths. Um, rather, you have to make the leap and the leap, in this case, will, will require or will um, involve faith in the absurd, uh, which, is, which always has a, a religious connotation for Kierkegaard. Um, so that's a little bit less satisfying um, for me as an atheist. But, um, yeah, I mean, where do, you, where do you draw the line with that? You know, that can, it seems to me you can use that type of, explanation or um, that kind of an attempt to kind of legitimize whatever it is you want to believe in whether it's um, fairies at the bottom of the garden or crystal healing or psychic abilities you know I mean anything can kind of come under that can fall under this rubric where you can just say well you, you, we can't prove it and no matter how much we try, we'll never, we'll never have the evidence. We just have to take it on faith. We have to make the leap. And it seems to give um, that this, this notion a little bit more credibility, I think, than it really deserves. Um, <clears throat> but still, that, that's, um, that's get God, right? We've got we've to gotta take that. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's religious at his core. Um, so one last thing to note about the leap is that it's constituted by the decision. So decision is, is important here. Um, and that comes in to, it's connected with the leap because reflection, if you, if you think about reflection, um, uh, intellectually kind of abstractly considering something, reflecting on something, that is by nature infinite. There is no end to that. You, you can reflect on something forever. But the only way to get out of reflection, the only way to stop reflection, is through a decision. And decision will always have to be made in passion and faith. And we'll have a look at that in the next section. But again, you can see that idea that, that reflection, you can't get from reflection to um I guess we're really talking about concrete action here, reflection to action. You can't get there with more reflection. It's going to require um, a leap. There is no, there is, there are no interme intermediary stages between reflection and 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 concrete action in the world. Um, the only way you can do that is through the leap, and the leap takes place in this sense through decision which we will turn to next so decision we're going to look at this one um, contrast two types of decision here that uh, what he, what Kierkegaard calls both and and either or so both and is a mediation between relative telos or relative goals, relative ends. Um, and the idea here is that you can do both A and B. Uh, so if any kind of goals that you might have in, in um, the finite world, the, you know, the, the physical, mundane, everyday, your everyday existence, any decision you're, you're faced with in that in that realm um, 
is a both and. You can you you'll always be able to do both A and B. You, you better work it or work it in such a way that you can usually do both. Um, the absolute telos, the absolute goal, however, is exclusive. It's more. Um, it, it it doesn't admit of this both and. It is rather an either or. You either do. You either make uh, this religious effort or. You don't. There's no having it both ways. You can't have both. You can't move towards your absolute telos and also keep your relative telos um, at the same level. You know, you you have to. Um, Kierkegaard says you can't you can't ignore the relative telos, but you have to relate to that relatively, whereas you relate to your absolute telos absolutely. So in that sense, it's an it's an either or. You're either in uh, completely, or or you're not. There's no there is no media. Uh, there's no middle ground. There's no having it both ways here. And that brings us to the decision, the either or decision. And the the best place to look to investigate this is is the book actually the the, the book called Either Or. And um, Either or, I think I've mentioned this before, either or is divided into two parts, actually three, but, but mainly two, where you've got the first part talking about A, or um, Johannes, who's the aesthete, the, the person living in the aesthetic sphere. He's living for the moment. He's chasing pleasure. Um, everything is immediate for him. <clears throat> and then B, judge, judge the Judge William, who is in the in the ethical, and he's arguing from the ethical perspective. And one way that you could interpret this is to, to say that well, these are this is the either or choice here. You either choose the aesthetic or you choose the ethical. Um, and Johannes has chosen the aesthetic, and and the judge has chosen the ethical. That, however, would is not quite the way to think about it and uh, Kierkegaard explains that Johannes actually hasn't taken the either or choice yet he hasn't come he hasn't brought himself to the decision yet um, and then and and chosen the the aesthetic and the reason for that is the either or choice the decision is absolute it's a choice between good and evil and that means that that choice the either or choice is itself already ethical so in making that decision and making that choice one is already on in the ethical sphere uh, so you can't make the either or choice from within the aesthetic sphere that's the idea uh, and to just go on with that, to choose the aesthetic, Kierkegaard says, is no choice at all because it's wholly immediate and it's made among a multiplicity of differing, offens, uh, differing options, any one of which may be chosen in the next moment. So it's, in effect, a choice made in that aesthetic sphere is a both-and choice. You can always... Um, pull back your decision and, and opt, for, for the, opt for another path instead. None of those decisions that you make in that sphere are binding. None of them are made um, with any kind of seriousness. The absolute either or, the absolute choice, um, the decision, arises not when this or that is chosen, but when the individual chooses with seriousness and proclaims itself in its inner infinitude. So what's important here in making the decision is that is the the way you approach it, the the, the seriousness with, with which you undertake that decision. It's not choosing this thing or that thing. That's not what the decision is. The decision is um, choosing, rather, how you're going to how all of your future choices 
will be understood, what frame, uh, what framework they'll be interpreted by. Um, and let, I'm, I've kind of run ahead of myself, so let me just keep working through my notes here. Such, such an attitude, the serious attitude, lifts the either or to the ethical sphere, uh, regardless of which path is chosen. So if someone then, after making the, the either or choice, then decides to choose the aesthetic, they've still made this choice under the category of the ethical. Even if the life they've chosen can best be described as unethical. So the, the decision, the either or choice is by its very nature ethical um, and and it doesn't turn on choosing this or that. Rather, it's it, it's um, it's a choice about how your your life ought to be viewed, how the decisions you make should be understood, should be interpreted, um, how you uh, your life is to be understood. In fact, so it's it's a little bit like a meta choice, not a choice. As such, not a choice about this or that, but a, a, a decision about that governs all of your future choices. That, that, that is an overarching kind of um, framework for your future life. Um, so yeah, that's that's the decision. That's the either or choice. Kierkegaard also says that it's it's not a choice in which a person becomes something different to what they were before. Rather, it's the choice in which one becomes oneself. Uh, and that's important because um, if you remember way back, we talked about this, this idea that um, becoming the, the change from non-being to being, or from possibility to actuality, it's not a change of essence, it's a change in being. If it was a change, if it were a change in essence, um, what you become would be different from what you were. And then you haven't become anything, there's no becoming, rather it's a transformation. And, uh, and that's not going to work here. That's not what Kierkegaard wants. So you don't become something different to what you were, but um, rather you become yourself for the first time. So it's, it's, that's kind of a nice way of putting it. And, um, Heidegger says something very similar um, in his, I think mainly in his, his post-being in time writings, but yeah, this idea that um, you kind of don't get your selfhood for free, as it were. And I think I've talked about that before, so I won't belabor that point. Um, one last point here uh, regarding passion, as, as far as it's con connect connected with decision. It's a quote. Once subjectivity is taken away, and passion from subjectivity, and infinite interest from passion, there is absolutely no decision at all, on this problem or any other. All decision, all essential decision, lies in subjectivity. So again, just just <clears throat> reinforcing that that idea that the decision is subjective. It's inward. It's made with passion, um, and without that, there is no decision. So okay, that's either or, um, and let's move on to the last section in this video, which will be resolution. Okay, so in, as far as resolution is concerned, uh, this, these are all tied in together, these ideas, the leap, decision, resolution. Um, so perhaps the best way to start this is to look at a short story um, Kierkegaard tells in the postscript. He talks about uh, a, a grandfather with his grandson, and they're at the, the grave of the boy's father, the, the grandfather's son. Uh, who had died an unbeliever. And the grandfather asks his grandson to vow never to lose his faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and the purpose of that story 
is to show the infinite passion of inwardness and to show specifically that it's more than a vow or a promise or a resolution that you renew every once in a while. Um, rather, and I'll read the quote for you, the solemnity with which it, the oath, was said seems less important when the continuing solemnity with which one keeps oneself from forgetting it day by day is a truer solemnity. So it's, it's uh, just, again, just reinforcing this idea. It's um, passion. Passion is, is, is crucial. It's uh, these, these things we're talking about. Kierkegaard's whole philosophy is built around passion and seriousness and, and making this, this absolute decision, uh, taking this leap um, in, in, in absolute seriousness. It's not, it's not something you can do half-heartedly. It's not something you do every Sunday when you go to church and then forget about for another week. It's something that it has to be central to your life. It has to drive your, your whole existence. Um, and, and that's what he's saying here. It's, it's, not, it's not a vow. It's not a, a promise that you renew at various times, um, and then you kind of forget about in between. It's something that has to be, um, you have to dedicate yourself to it every day. It's not, not uh, and I like that. I wouldn't, obviously, I wouldn't um, run with it uh, as far as in, in a religious sense, but I think there is, you know, there is something important to that, to, to find something that that you can commit yourself to that you can in a way kind of build your life around you know a, a central focus focal point um and resolution he talks about uh resolution the quiet dedication of resolution so it's not it's it's not something that uh you make a big show of it's not something external it's not something for other people it's not something that other people have to know about or, or believe or see in you. In fact, it's not something that they can see in you, Kierkegaard would say. It's, it's subjective. It's inward. Um, and even if you try and display it, it's, it's, no one else can, can really grasp it because by, by very, its very nature, it's subjective. It's inward. Um, and so... Uh, that that's a, a re repetition of it, this theme that we've seen again and again right throughout this whole video series, I think. Um, so anyway, resolution, moving into, I'll just discuss, he talks about resolution in um, stages on life's way. So that's where I'm, I'm heading with this next, uh, this next section. Resolution comes from deliberation. And in resolution, the deliberation and the resolution occur together in the moment of decision. So there's that, that tie in with, with decision, how this, um, how these things, these pieces kind of fit together. Any human act that is to have meaning or significance must come about as a result of resolution. And um, there are two kinds of resolution, positive and negative. So the positive kind of resolution, the positive type, consolidates life, guarantees a happy outcome, and brings rest to the individual. Fair enough. The negative resolution keeps the individual in suspense and is continually ambiguous. The possible always lurks in the background with the negative resolution and creates conflict with life. Um, okay. So I think the best way to kind of discuss that in a bit more detail is, is through a quote. And Kierkegaard says, The negative resolution is for the eternal only, the positive for both the temporal and the eternal, and thus the person is simultaneously temporal and eternal. Therefore, the ideality of the genuine resolution lies first of all in a resolution that is just as temporal as eternal. The genuinely idealizing resolution, then, has this characteristic. 
it is signed in heaven, and then it is countersigned in temporality. Okay, so let's just see if we can bring this together a bit. Um, the negative resolution is for the eternal only. The negative resolution is um, kind of abstract. It's, it's this, it comes about through um, an over intellectual, overly into being overly intellectual from uh, this abstract type of thinking, this um, concern more with re reflection and, and philosophizing, Kierkegaard would have said, rather than um, anything concrete, anything real, anything, uh, not, it's not actually engaged with life. Um, and so that this, in that sense, it's continually ambiguous. There's, there's, a decision has never been made. You know, nothing's been, um, nothing's been committed to. It's all just abstract. It's all possibility. So possibility, he says, lurks in the background of the negative resolution. It's never, nothing is determined. Nothing is fixed. Not fixed, but nothing is, is, um, has been committed to, I think, is, is the, the best way to put that. Um, and, and in that sense, it creates conflict. There's always conflict with life because you don't have that direction. You don't have that driving force, that force driving you forward. Um, whereas the positive resolution is both temporal and eternal. And that's a theme we've seen again and again, right? The, um, the individual human life is constantly straddling balancing the eternal and the temporal and that, that was what we talked about way back at the beginning too with the synthesis which which created um the self the spirit it was a synthesis synthesis of soul and body or infinite and finite um and and we see see that again here that's and that's the only way um human existence comes about it's yeah it's what it means to exist as a human being this this um, balance between the temporal and the eternal uh, so it's signed in heaven countersigned in, countersigned in temporality it's temporal and concrete uh, and again that's another thing that that we always see in Kierkegaard it has to be has to be um, <clears throat> tangible has to be concrete, has to be real, lived, not just philosophized, abstractly thought about. Um, but it incorporates the eternal, it incorporates this, this transcendent, um, eternal, infinite soul dimension of our, of our being. And incorporates that because it seeks to to make that concrete make that um that ideal concrete bring it into the temporal and so that's that's the connection between the two we're taking we, we we've got this infinite eternal are those synonyms <laughs> we've got this this eternal ideal but we're trying to to to, to manifest it concretely in the temporal um, and so that's how this positive resolution um, incorporates the eternal into it into its uh, existence into its into its life uh, as Kierkegaard says the more concrete a person becomes in the ideality the more perfect is the ideality abstraction is ideality's first expression but concretion is its, 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 is its essential expression. And so that's just a nice summary of that. The ideal, the, um, <clears throat> you know, those, those abstract, kind of ethical, religious, um, intellectual understandings, they are, they are, That's that's where the ideal first appears in the, in abstract form in a highly intellectualized um, space, 
but when it is when that when those ideas are made concrete when they're brought down to earth that's when they reach their essential expression um, so i like that it's got it's quite um, nice and applicable even without the um, religious dimension i think um, so just moving on from that uh, a couple of other notes or one one more point really the probability and outcome have no part in resolution Kierkegaard says um, probability and outcome seek guarantees rather than passionately embracing the resolution so again there's, there's this idea of um, trying to build up evidence get enough evidence get enough knowledge or experience uh, so that there's no doubt left um, but if you do that, then you, you don't achieve the transcendent, the absolute telos that Kierkegaard's aiming at. Because you can't get there through evidence or knowledge or experience. You can't go from the objective to the subjective. There is no path. That, that, that's why it requires the leap, the qualitative leap. So if, you, if you're looking for probabilities, you're looking to... to you're looking for safeguards. You're looking for a safe bet. You're, you're trying to weigh up uh, what's 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 better. What, what's going to do? Um, I don't know. What's going to have the best outcome, or what's going to what's more likely to be true? Kierkegaard doesn't want any of that. It has to be this decision has to be made resolutely with passion, um, and it will necessarily have to be uh, a leap because you can't go from one to the other. So probability is kind of a, a blind alley for Kierkegaard. And also outcome. Um, and this seems to, to go kind of right to the core of utilitarianism, which is all about outcome. It's the only consideration. So Kierkegaard's flipping the script on that and saying you can't have, uh, or saying that, that anything, a decision made in resolution can't be based on the outcome because you don't know what the outcome is going to be if, and even if you you could know for sure um, there's no guarantee that that an outcome that say produces the, the greatest happiness for the greatest number is is the, the the right outcome is the sorry is the is indicative of or points you in the direction of the right decision or maybe the, the the outcome that the decision that, that yields an outcome in which everybody is disappointed in you uh, that you haven't followed along with with whatever their beliefs are or that you've you've gone a different path maybe that is still the best decision for you to take maybe that that's the one that um, that you ought to take so outcome is irrelevant passion is key as Kierkegaard says, probability and outcome have no hold over resolution because what is being purchased is being purchased a tout prix at all costs. Doesn't matter what, there is no um, hedging your bets. You shouldn't be trying to find the, any kind of um, safe course here. That, and that's not what the absolute talos is. It's not what it demands for Kierkegaard. And the last thing I want to mention is just an example of resolution, which the example is marriage. Um, and I think I've talked about this before, um, perhaps in, in a similar context too. But uh, but marriage is is a duty. It's It's a decision. It's something you have to commit to and you have to, to to maintain that level of commitment with passion resolutely unlike um, romantic love for example which which doesn't really require you to commit it doesn't really require you to um, passionately or resolutely decide to keep going pa uh, romantic love if you know, if you've been in love, it, it doesn't require any effort. You, um, you, you're, you're always thinking about the other person. You always want to be with them. 
uh, there's no there's no effort there's no, re no no sense in which you are resolutely committing yourself to anything there's no decision being made in fact it's the exact opposite of, of making a decision you're just kind of going along with with your feelings at the time um, and so that as I say just it just happens by itself and it sustains itself there's no there's no no resolute no um, resolution um, with romantic love but with with marriage we see that you no longer have that that kind of um, wave of passion kind of keeping you going you have to create that you have to generate it and you have to maintain it um, resolutely you have to make that decision every day um, and so that's that's a good example there of resolution all right let me stop there let's have a quick look at a um, at a summary okay so first of all we looked at the leap and um, we saw that it was qualitative not quantitative so there was no cumulative um, path to go from a to b um, we also saw that it's not constituted uh, sorry it is constituted by decision so it's connected with decision um, yeah and then we looked at decision itself and we just dis distinguished between both and and either or and the way that both and applied in um, when we're thinking about our relative ends as opposed to either or which was by by its very nature an absolute um, an ab related to absolute goal our absolute goal um, and it was a choice about oneself it was a choice in which one becomes oneself one doesn't change or become someone different and of course it was made with made in subjectivity uh, with passion and with infinite interest and finally we looked at resolution which happened in the moment of decision so there's that connection that connecting thread there were two kinds of resolution positive and negative the positive um, happened in abstract it, was, it dealt with the eternal only uh, sorry the negative happened with in the abstract dealing with um, the eternal only and that it lacked any kind of concretion as opposed to the positive which was a, a balance which brought in both the temporal and and uh, the eternal and brought them together trying to kind of manifest the eternal ideal in temporal form and finally we looked at an example of uh, resolution which in the form of marriage which we saw was kind of a duty something you had to work at something you, you resolutely had to decide um, to maintain to keep to keep alive as opposed to romantic love which which keeps itself going it doesn't need any any kind of decision or, or resolute activity on your on your behalf so that's pretty much where i'm going to wrap up if you've made it this far thanks for listening uh hopefully this has helped like i say next time we'll look at temporality and uh the moment but for now uh let me sign off what else do i have to say nothing thank you <laughs> i'll see you next time